Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. It's really nice to see you this evening. My name is Richard Locke. I'm a professor of political science and international public affairs, and I currently serve as a provost. And it's really wonderful to see you all at this uh, uh, Reaffirming University Values uh, talk. Um, this lecture is going to feature our very own uh, John Friedman, who is also a professor uh, in the economics department and here at Watson in International Public Affairs. And what this series seeks to do is to what I think universities, not just Brown, but all universities should and must do, which is to apply rigorous scholarship and engage in thoughtful, informed discussion around some of society's most pressing challenges. Uh, this is a series that's co-sponsored by the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, but also working with lots of different academic departments as well as different centers uh, and even uh, the Division of Campus Life. And the goal of this series, which has now been going on for about two years, uh, is to basically uh, advance uh, knowledge and understanding. And what we're seeking to do is to probe ideas and question assumptions by trying to apply insightful research uh, and explore the truth. This is what I think universities should be doing in our teaching, in our research, in our engagement, and this is specifically uh, what this series tries to do. We try to take issues that are difficult issues, we try to bring people who come at those issues from very different perspectives, uh, and to engage in them uh, using fact and logic and balanced and open discussion. Now, John Friedman's research, not just this particular research that he's uh, going to talk to us about tonight, but research in general uh, more, very much fits within the spirit of this uh, talk. He basically, in all of his different research, uh, uses large-scale administrative data uh, to explore important issues uh, and especially pressing societal issues, issues like education and taxation and health care. Now, John is an associate professor in the economics department and also in the Watson Institute, uh, as well as the director of the Equal Opportunity Project, whose mission is, and let me quote, develop scalable policy solutions that will empower families to rise out of poverty and achieve better life outcomes. So that's a really important uh, uh, goal. Uh, in addition to the work that he's going to be talking about tonight, one of his more well-known studies used a massive data set from a large urban school system. So it had two and a half million students, 18 million test scores over two decades to explore the role and effects of teacher quality over the course of a student's life. And this is important because what we know is access to high quality education. You know, not just, you know, the quality of the infrastructure, but the quality of the teachers, the quality of the system is probably one of, if not the, most important factors uh, that affects our life chances, our life choices, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and John has been working on these issues for a number of uh, years and has very important uh, policy uh, implications. His work has been published in top academic journals as well as in major media outlets and was cited by President Obama in his 2012 State of the Union Address. Professor Friedman came to Brown in 2015 from the Harvard Kennedy School. And prior to this, he worked as special assistant to the President for Economic Policy at the National Economic Council in the White House. Tonight, we are very fortunate to hear about his recent work, which focuses on the role of higher education in advancing opportunity and leveling the economic playing field. This is an issue that is a very hot issue, not just on this campus, but throughout uh, higher education. Uh, the work that John has been doing with several of his colleagues has already received widespread attention and media coverage uh, and is driving important conversations that I think all of us have to ha have. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming John Friedman. Uh, well, thanks, Rick, and it's uh, thank you to, uh, to all of you for coming here today, uh, slogging through the rain, at least it wasn't snow, to uh, spend an hour here uh, this afternoon. Uh, as Rick said, my work focuses on upward mobility and thinking about uh, what are the causes of different mobility for kids from different backgrounds in the U.S., and what we can ultimately do from a policy perspective in order to address that. And it's especially that last part, which I really want to get to and focus on today, 
Uh, what I'm going to try to do is talk about some of the, the findings that we've generated so far, uh, first in the higher education space and then more broadly in terms of the importance of neighborhoods, and then talk about what I think is the question that uh, really we should all be asking is basically what do we do now? What, what are the steps concretely that we can take in order to take this research from being ideas to actually improving upward mobility? I think this is also uh, a fitting topic for this lecture series, right? Because I think it's not just the subject of the lecture, the uh, opportunity, which is an important social issue, but I think having a diverse student body and a diverse set of scholars here on campus is a necessary condition, albeit not a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition to have the type of open exchange of ideas that is the core of uh, our community here and is the subject of, uh, of this lecture. So first, just to start from the beginning, why do we think that opportunity is such an important issue to study in society today? Well, let me show one uh, chart. This is not my work, but I think it's uh, something my co-authors put together. What it shows is the probability that kids in each cohort, so kids that were born in 1940 up through kids who were born in 2000, uh, 19, uh, 1980, grow up to earn more than their parents did. Now, this is a very crude measure, but it is certainly a measure which is what many people associate with the American dream, that each child, no matter their background, has the opportunity to rise up and make a better life for themselves. Now, what the data show is that 70 years ago, so this is when my parents were born, 90% of children grew up to achieve the American dream by this measure. And children were so successful that in many cases, people talked about doubling standards of living, not even just surpassing their parents as the real sense of the American dream. But what's happened over the 50 years following, so by the time we get down to 1980 here, when I was born, children have no better than a 50-50 chance, a coin flip of, of achieving the American dream by this measure. And as I'll show you later in the talk, this has happened in different ways in different places that I think correlates very strongly with the type of real anger that is out there about the lack of opportunity for children in America. And so I think that understanding what's going on behind this decline and then ultimately getting to policies that can help reverse it or at least stabilize it is incredibly important for research and for policy. And so that's the goal of the Equality of Opportunity Project. This is my two co-authors and I have put this together. And in many different settings, we try to use big data to understand how to revive the American dream. And here I'm going to talk about colleges, but we really try to study a, a wide range of different ages and interventions and think about all of the different factors that come together to determine how children have opportunity coming from different backgrounds. And so I'm going to start today, as Rick talked about, with the link between colleges and intergenerational mobility. In some sense, this is the most direct sense that it's not only about opportunity from a national perspective, but it's also directly related to the types of values here on campus. And so it's probably a good in and of itself, even if it had nothing to do with uh, this economic mobility. Now, I think we all have the intuition that places like Brown can play a critical role in upward mobility, especially for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the data are very clear that this is, in fact, the case. So what I want to start with, and this is all data from students at Brown, uh, is to think about kids coming from different slices of the parent income distribution. And I've constructed these five bins as quintiles so that mechanically there are 20% of students born in each year in these bins. And what we can first do is say, well, let's look at those students who actually showed up at Brown. How did they do when we look at them after they left in the labor market? And what we can see here is that on average, let's start with kids from the poorest 20% of households, they end up at about the 72nd, 73rd percentile nationally. That's compared to other kids that were born in the same year. What happens to children from Brown who come from much wealthier families, that come from families in the top fifth of the income distribution who earn more than about $100,000? they also end up at about the 73rd income percentile. And of course, there's a great deal of variation within there. But on average, 
I think this is an amazing fact about Brown as an institution. Here we have children coming from dramatically different financial circumstances. And still at the end of the day, Brown is leveling the playing field such that everyone coming out is bringing to have an equal opportunity at success. And so I think this demonstrates right here the possibility of higher education to have a transformative impact on opportunity and upward mobility in America. Now, what's the catch? Even though children from these different backgrounds have an equal opportunity at success once they're here, we do not take in students at equal rates from these different backgrounds. And so here we can plot just a, a distribution of where the students actually come from. And we see that only 4% of students come from this uh, poorest fifth of households, and 70% of students come from the richest fifth of households. And you can even telescope further out into the tail here. The data show that about 20% of students come from the richest 1% of households. Those are households making more than about $600,000 annually. And about 4% of students come from the richest 0.1% of households who make more than about $3 million annually. And so I think just as striking is it that once they're here, students seem to have very similar outcomes despite these widely varying backgrounds. I think it's equally striking that we have the same number of students on campus from the bottom 20% of the distribution nationally as we do from the top 0.1%, right? Mechanically, there are 200 times more people here than there are over here, and yet we have the same number on campus. So these are the data just for Brown, but this encapsulates the core trade-off that most higher education institutions face where there's a great amount of impact once students are here, but access is sharply limited. Now, we can think about how Brown sits in the distribution compared with other schools. And so it's just starting on the access front, looking at where students come from. So this shows the same distribution, the five different quintiles, and then the top 1% for a, a selection of uh, peer institutions. And so the first thing to see is that you know, we're actually not really abnormal. We fit right inside the, kind of the, the, normal, the, the distribution for this. If anything, where are we a little bit different? It's that um, we have a, a fewer number of uh, students from these middle income quintiles, three and four, than we do, uh, than other schools do. And it's not enormous. We're talking about maybe 18% um, maybe as opposed to 22, 23%. Um, but the reason I put this up is that this is exactly the slice of students that the new Brown Promise uh, policy is targeting. Right? This is providing more uh, uh, transferring loans into grants for, for families that are, that are in this range who are not um, at, the, at the bottom of the income distribution but who are not uh, wealthy either. And so I think this is a good example of how we can start to kind of see the basis for some of what, uh, what the policies that you might be able to implement right in these data. We can also think about how Brown looks compared to other schools uh, nationally uh, on access and on outcomes. And so here's this just plot that I showed you before. I'm showing you a slightly different measure of, of outcome, which is the, pro, pro, the fraction of students that get into the top 20%. That's earning more than about $60,000 a year. And we can compare what this looks like for Brown to what the same figure looks like for UC Berkeley. So here, Berkeley has roughly similar outcomes for their students. So that's shown in the gold here. But their distribution of student backgrounds is quite different than ours. They have roughly twice as many students from low-income families. Um, instead of 4%, it's about 9%. And they have fewer students coming from um, the very, very top of the income distribution. And of course, part of this is because it's a public school. And part of this is because it's in California. But as I think I'll argue later, there's, there's, some, there's a core here where uh, saying that we should uh, aspire to be uh, as diverse as Rhode Island Community College is just maybe not a reasonable goal. Thinking about what Berkeley does is just much more reasonable as something uh, we can aim for. But nationally, this type of trade-off 
where you see institutions with similar outcomes but somewhat different levels of access, I think is very interesting and important. Because what it means is that it's not an ironclad trade-off where there's no way to produce better outcomes among your students unless you admit fewer students from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's possible to, to do both at the same time. And these are the institutions that we should be looking to in order to understand what we can do in order to, to further improve uh, what's going on here uh, at Brown and at other elite schools. Now, rather than showing you this picture for thousands of colleges nationally, I'm going to summarize this into just these two numbers. So here's access is the fraction of parents from the bottom fifth. And then I'm going to call the success rate the fraction of students who reach the top fifth. So at Brown, these are 4% and 53% respectively. Both of them are important for thinking about mobility. And in fact, if you just multiply them together, you can calculate what we call the mobility rate so at Brown, that's 2.4% of students. This is, you can interpret this as the fraction of all students on campus who are bottom to top success stories, who both came from families that were quite poor and themselves achieved economic success once they graduated. And then this provides a nice summary measure that we can compare across lots of schools nationally to get a sense for how things vary. And so just to give you a sense of what are the, uh, the highest ranked schools in the nation on this, this is the top 10. Uh, you see schools that do not look like Brown University. Six out of ten schools on this list are uh, kind of somewhat selective or non-selective four-year public schools. So right in the middle tier of the American public uh, higher education system. So like Cal State or uh, U-Texas Pan American, CUNY, uh, Cal State Poly, UTEP. These are schools which succeed in both having a very large number of students on campus from, from poor backgrounds, but also producing very good outcomes for them. And to give you an example, the Ivy League is down here. Now, this comparison is not quite fair because these schools are just operating with a vastly different business model than, than elite schools. And so that both reflects the reality that due to their size and, and makeup, Ivy League schools will never be a broad-based solution to upward mobility in America. Just far too few uh, students, and it, it's targeted too much at uh, people who are uh, kind of top achievers. What you do see, though, is if you redo this, looking at kids who get into the top 1%, so who really succeed, who are leaders in their fields, that has Ivy League schools right in the top. And Brown is at something like the 96th percentile or 97th percentile of that measure nationally. Now, how have these things been changing over time? There have been a lot of policies that have been put into place in order to improve access uh, here at Brown, at other private elite schools. While at the same time, we've seen sharply cut budgets within many public school systems around the country, especially in the wake of the Great Recession. And so what this chart shows is how this access measure, the fraction of students from poor families, has evolved over time. So here I'm showing it to you for Brown and then for the Ivy League average. And what you see is that Brown has actually it started below the Ivy League average at the beginning of our sample and is, is about the Ivy League average when our data end in uh, 2011, which would have been about the class of uh, 2013 or 14. But what you also see is that things haven't moved that much the fraction of poor students at Ivy League schools as a whole has gone up from about four to maybe four and a half percent over this period, which is obviously better than nothing, but I think falls short of what many people had hoped would be the impact of this great expansion in financial aid. And so I think that poses the question, well, like what should we do in order to continue to improve on this? And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So stepping back from college, though, right? fundamentally, maybe we could get this number from 4% up to 8% to be closer to where Berkeley is, but we're not going to get it to 20. Why are we not going to get it to 20? Because we're starting at age 18 or 19 when children have been through 20 years of vastly different upbringings and exposure. And so in order to fully understand what's going on, it's important to step back from the universities and think about what's happening in these students' lives before they get to school. What are the other factors that are important? And so that's something that I've also been working on recently, trying to think about the impact of neighborhoods in determining opportunity. So first, just to set the stage on neighborhoods, this is a map 
um, that my uh, co-authors produced while I was in the White House. And what this shows is the fraction of poor children reaching the top 20%, the same outcome measure that I was using, but not for colleges, for all the different uh, cities in the country. And what you see is that there's an enormous amount of variation here. Right? We see cities in the south, like Atlanta and Charlotte, where just 4.5% of children from poor families achieve this measure of success. And then places like Providence or Seattle, Sacramento, Salt Lake City have numbers that are nearly three times higher. What these uh, researchers also showed is that, for the most part, these differences across place are causal. That is, if you move from Atlanta to Seattle, your kids will actually do better. It's not just something about people, you know, different types of people being in different types of places, right? Maybe everyone who lives in Sacramento is very tech-oriented and tech-oriented um, parents and kids do differently. It's not that. How do we know this? Well, it's exactly looking at children who move across these neighborhoods. So what you can do is you can take two kids, for instance, that move from Atlanta to Providence. Providence is a higher opportunity neighborhood. The earlier you move to Providence, the more years of exposure you have to whatever it is that is going on in Providence that is helpful for opportunity. And so the better you should do. And that's exactly what you see in the data. When children move from Atlanta to Providence at very young ages, they have quite good outcomes that look very similar to what happens for kids who grow up in Providence their entire life. Whereas at kids, for kids who move at much later ages between Atlanta and Providence, they actually, despite the fact that they moved to Providence, still basically look like the children who spent their entire lives in Atlanta. So this highlights the importance of not just college, but everywhere where you grow up. But still, I think the core question remains, like, what should we do with this? Right? If we look here, uh, you know, we can say, well, what should Atlanta do? Well, we can say, well, moving to Minneapolis would be a good idea. That sounds hard. Maybe we should try to make Atlanta a better city, but telling Atlanta, be more like Minneapolis, I don't think that's very helpful either. And here at Brown, just telling us, oh, go be like Cal State LA, that's not very helpful. So how do we actually take this and make it useful for policymakers to help us figure out what we should actually do? And that's, I think, the core of, of how I really want to spend the last um, 10 or 15 minutes talking in this lecture and, and how I've really started to think about what's the important output from this research. So one thing you can do is you can look at some of the characteristics of cities to try to understand uh, how they differ and what might explain these differences in opportunity. So let me give you one example here. This is a map from a sociologist who took the 2010 census and just put a dot on the map for every household, except he colored the dot depending on the self uh, declared race of the household in the census. So here in Atlanta, um, black households are green, white households are blue, uh, red households are Asians, and orange households are Hispanics. You can see in like this lower right, lower left half of the map, it's essentially 100% black. And then in this upper uh, right corner of the map, there are pockets of minorities, but there are many neighborhoods where it's just 100% white. It's an extremely segregated city, and Atlanta is an extremely low opportunity place. And you can compare what this map looks like with what the map looks like for Sacramento. Sacramento has the same share of non-white residents, but if you look at the map, they are distributed much differently. There are majority white neighborhoods that have lots of specks of blue and green and orange, showing that there are many minorities in those neighborhoods. Then there are also majority minority neighborhoods that are themselves uh, a mix of many different races. Uh, and so here's one factor that correlates very strongly with upward mobility. So this starts to give us a sense for what might make a difference, but still just telling Atlanta become less segregated like Sacramento, that's a really hard thing. That's not actionable. Right? Or we can look at the same map here for Providence. Providence is about average in terms of segregation in the US. It's a little bit more segregated um, than average. And you, know, you see how even still in, in Providence, there are uh, wide uh, variations across neighborhoods in terms of uh, race. So what are we, uh, how do we actually, how can we use these data for policy? So I'm going to lay out a framework for how I want to think about this. 
And I think there are three key steps for taking the data and having impact on upward mobility. So the first thing where I think the data are most helpful is in diagnosis. And what we need to do is not just state that there is a problem, but we really need to dive in and figure out where the problem is and learn much more about it so that we can understand what the appropriate policy solutions are. So you can ask where are the places in greatest need, not, you know, in Atlanta, there's, I'm going to show you, there's a great deal of variation in opportunity even across uh, poor black neighborhoods. We can ask what are different policy approaches that might be effective and when in a child's life do these disparities arise? And I'm going to walk through all of these uh, with an example in a second. What happens next? Well, then you want to go to a treatment phase where you're still not going to have an exact solution to the problem, even if you can diagnose the problem. Right? So maybe it turns out that what's really happening is there's a um, poor children are not going to college at the rate that they should, despite the fact that they have very good test scores. So we can figure out what is it that we can target to that exact problem to, 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 to make a difference. And then third, of course, I'm a researcher, so you want to evaluate the impact and, and kind of disseminate things. You want to make sure that what you did actually worked. And the idea is that this process, when iterated, can lead to a set of scalable solutions that might increase mobility across neighborhoods and colleges. So how might this work? Let me give you an example from um, some neighborhood work. So this is a map similar to the one I showed you, except it's looking only at Seattle. This is the only city where we're actually cleared to show you the data. Um, you, we're gonna, I could show you this for Providence um, in a few months. And what you see, for anyone who's familiar with, with Seattle, right here is the, the downtown central district here. Uh, this is Bellevue, uh, a bunch of quite wealthy um, eastern suburbs, where green means that uh, poor children do very well who grow up there. So that's, I think, less surprising. What maybe is more surprising is that there are places here where kids do equally well so you don't have to move to the rich suburb in order to find opportunity for children. And so I've pulled out two neighborhoods here, Del Ridge and Normandy Park. The reason why I've chosen these is that these are two neighborhoods, as I'll show you, that have very similar characteristics if you were to just look at them. If you were to ask what share of residents are living in poverty, if you were to ask how much it costs to rent an apartment, these are very similar. And yet, we see that opportunity differs quite a bit across those places. So based on this, what's one way that we can try to use these precision diagnostics in order to help residents or help cities? Well, we can encourage people, especially people who are using, uh, who are making choices about where to live and who are using housing vouchers, to live in places with more opportunity. And so that's one branch of what I think is an effective set of solutions. You can use choice-based solutions. And in fact, uh, when you do this in Seattle, if you just look at where are voucher holders using their vouchers, where they're using them is in places like Del Ridge, which are down here. What does this plot show? It shows the rent for uh, a median apartment on the horizontal axis, and then this opportunity measure on the y-axis. Right? So even among places which cost $1,200 a month to rent a two-bedroom apartment, Voucher holders are choosing about the worst neighborhood that they could in terms of opportunity. And I don't want to minimize the, bar the barriers that exist for them living in other neighborhoods, but cost is not a barrier because there are neighborhoods like Normandy Park up here, which are actually cheaper, but considerably higher opportunity. And so we're actually working with the housing authorities in Seattle to try to both embed this information in housing vouchers and help overcome a number of other barriers. So for instance, it turns out to be quite difficult to just find a landlord who's willing to rent to you, even if the apartment is appropriately priced and it's something you want, to try to uh, use this as one approach to, to solving um, this problem of opportunity. What's another way that you can think about this problem? You can think about place-based solutions. Why is this important? It's because no matter how many people think and use, think about and use this information when choosing places to live, moving all of the residents out of a poor neighborhood is just not a feasible solution. That's not something that's going to work. So at some point, we're actually going to have to get into it and fix some of the neighborhoods that aren't great. How can the data help here? It can help us diagnose the problem at an even more fine level than just knowing that this is a low opportunity neighborhood. So what do I have in mind? We can think about different points along the timeline of childhood where we can have discrete different interventions. And then we can ask, 
where along this timeline do neighborhoods seem to fall off the path? So now I'm going to give you an example from Atlanta. In Atlanta, here are uh, two districts. So th these are two districts that you might think about in the choice-based approach. These are two um, essentially 100% minority neighborhoods in Atlanta. Virginia Highland is the place that you might want to use your vouchers, and English Ave and Vine City is a neighborhood where you don't want to use your vouchers. And what you can see here is that while the two neighborhoods are somewhat similar in terms of uh, the fraction of children born at a healthy birth weight, immediately, already by the time we get to third grade, the test scores are much, much lower in English Ave and Vine City. And just the slide kind of continues down so that college attendance rates are some of the lowest in Atlanta. But what if moving everyone to Virginia Highland is not possible? Well, let's now think about a different comparison. Think about comparing English Ave and Vine City to Thomasville Heights. So this is a, a, another very low opportunity neighborhood, but one whose profile is quite different. The way in which children lack opportunity in Thomasville Heights is quite different than in English Ave and Vine City. Right? They end up in the same place. But if you look here, the eighth grade test scores, they weren't great compared to Virginia Ave, but they're considerably better than Thomasville Heights. Right? So this now allows us to dig in further and say, well, it's not just something general or unknown that's happening in English Ave and Vine City. What seems to be happening when the students are in high school, between eighth grade and when they might enroll in college? Maybe the problem is they're not in high school. Maybe the problem is they're in high school, but they're not being appropriately guided to success. We can dig in even further and ask, is this a problem that's occurring among boys or girls facing very different challenges in high school? Is this a problem that is occurring more among racial minorities? In this case, they're essentially all racial minorities. But or is this occurring among parents uh, who um, are themselves quite educated but still live in poor neighborhoods? Or are they occurring more among children from very poor, uh, poor households? And this will help further uh, nail down uh, what exactly you want to do. And I think you can actually imagine taking this and say, well, we don't have exactly the answer for what is wrong with high school in English Ave and Vine City. But something is happening at that age in particular that we need to target. And I think this is a much more constructive approach than just saying, go be like Minneapolis. Now, how do we apply this uh, to college? College access is obviously one of the things on this timeline. And so I'm going to circle back now to think about what we started with. How do we think about college access as a potential solution to some of these problems? And so I think that you can apply this type of precision medicine approach to opportunity in colleges, thinking both about access and opportunity. But to do so, you really need to dig into the details. And so what we've done to do that is we've recruited a number of partners, about uh, 200 colleges nationally, who are working with us to share data to really understand what's going on inside the admissions process. Some of these schools have selective admissions. Some of them don't. What's going on inside uh, the campus? What courses of study are they taking? What programs are there in order to help students succeed? How can we help students from poor background actually get through school and graduate? What are the particular barriers that we need to overcome? And I, uh, I, so I was just talking with uh, Rick before this. Very much hope we can uh, make sure that Brown is on this list. What are we actually going to do? Well, we're going to ask different questions when thinking about access and success. For access, we can think about how do you find and attract more talented students? Who are the students in the pool who we can identify by studying these long-term outcomes as actually really quite talented, who we really want to go after, who, for whatever reason, we're not currently recognizing? How can we expand the pool of, uh, of, of students who are applying that we're excited about. On the success side, we need to understand how we can support success, not just in general, but in varied ways. Right? And in the same way that what might be needed for success in one neighborhood in Atlanta is going to be different from what's needed in another neighborhood in Atlanta, which is certainly going to be different from a neighborhood in El Paso or in Providence, what's needed to support student success for children from poor backgrounds, but who have very educated parents, is going to be quite different from what we need to, uh, to support students who might come from more affluent backgrounds, but whose parents did not go to college. Right? Those are just two different settings, even within Brown. And of course, that's going to vary tremendously from what we're going to need to support student success at a place like Cal State LA. 
And so once again, I think the challenge here is to use the data in order to, to harness everything that we know about all the different types of colleges nationally to understand what's appropriate for Brown. And we can look at Brown, we can look at similar places, we can look at what's worked for similar students in similar settings. And ultimately, you want to ask, what would it take to make a large difference in broad-based access and mobility? Right? Can we implement changes that double the fraction of poor kids that we have on campus right, that requires both changes on the admission side and on the success side to make sure that those students have the, the, the support that they need once they get here? And I think, you know, again, ultimately, the goal of this is always to, to really have an impact on opportunity. So just to close, let me kind of summarize what, what I think is the framework here. The challenge is that reviving the American dream and providing opportunity for children requires local action in the sense that what you need is going to be not unrelated, but is going to be special and specific to each setting. Now, how do you understand, how do you use data in that setting? Well, that's where big data comes to help. You can use big data to essentially have a social science version of precision medicine, to really understand what is the problem that you face and therefore what types of policy solutions you uh, can offer. Then once you've understood the problem, you need to prescribe treatments to address these different diagnoses. And there, that's where working with local stakeholders is incredibly important, not just because they're going to understand what the community needs and, and what might work much better than any researcher would, but also it's important to always give the community a, a, a real you know, ownership stake in what's going on so that you know, when we are long gone, the community will still be able to benefit from these programs. And then third, there's another challenge, which is how to evaluate these policies in a timely manner. Right? Even if we were to put in a very ambitious admissions policy with the goal of increasing the number of poor students who succeed economically, Rick comes to me and he says, you know, I want to see, understand whether this works. And then I go back and I say, well, gee, let's wait 15 years until a couple of cohorts have gone through and become age 30. And I'm guessing that's not quite going to work for you. We need, we need to know a little bit sooner than that. Uh, and so here, too, I think there's a solution in the data which is that you let the data be the guide for what are the appropriate choices of short-term proxies. So I'll give you an example. Many people, many schools use academic achievement during the first year in school as a measure to judge kind of how students are succeeding on campus. You know, that's a real measure. It's not like it's randomly chosen, but it turns out to be just totally uncorrelated with long-term stuff. It's just a terrible measure. Why? We can think about what's going on. It's intuitive. You know, these kids are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, and there's all sorts of struggles that they face. And if you can get them over it, and in a place like Brown, most of them do get over it, you can get them through it, they have a, a, a path to success. Some students don't face those challenges, and, and they really they end up in the same place. And so using these short-term proxies that, that are not good measures can actually lead to, to, to concluding the wrong thing about whether this is working or not. You know, wow, we have a bunch of new students on campus and you know, the rate of failure in first year classes has gone up. That's a big problem. Well, it is a problem. We need to fix it. But that shouldn't let us conclude that this policy was a bad idea. Rather, we can figure out what does predict these long-term outcomes so that we can credibly evaluate these policies uh, in a reasonable time. So let me stop there. I think we've got about 20 minutes left. Love to hear your questions and comments on, on, on this work. And um, just very excited to, uh, to uh, engage with, with a community that I've been so happy to be a part of over the last three years. Please, I, I don't know, I'm supposed to moderate. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I have two questions. The Please. first one is, at what age did you measure the data for the income post graduation, like mm -hmm. you said that students after graduating Brown reach a certain income percentile. Mm -hmm. At what age did you say that they reach that percentile? So we're measuring it in their mid-30s. Okay. And it turns out, uh, I think, you know, your intuition that, you know, we don't want to be measuring income when students are in medical school or in grad school or doing an internship. That's exactly right. You see it in the data, especially for students coming out of an elite school like Brown. It takes a while to kind of get up to where your uh, kind of steady state uh, income is going to be. Now, students will con continue to earn more and more in dollars once they get into their 40s and 50s. But what we find in the data is that their place in the overall distribution 
pretty much stabilizes on average. And so while the distribution is continuing to stretch, whether you're at the 75th percentile or the median or something like that is, is a pretty, uh, pretty good measure. Thank you. And my second question was, what is the mobility rate for middle income students who are in the bot bottom third or bottom fourth yeah. percentile? Sure. I mean, so you can, you know, what's nice is that you can just um, multiply these things together. And so um, backing up all the way to the beginning here. Um, so right here, uh, right, you're just going to want to take the fraction. So let's just take the middle quintile. Um, there are about 8% or so of students on campus from the middle quintile. They, too, have about a, let's round to 50% as a chance of, of getting into the upper, uh, upper quintile. So multiplying them together, you're going to get about a 4%. Uh, four percent rate. Um, it turns out, you know, lots of people like to define mobility in a different way. You can do bottom three quintiles to the top quintile, bottom three to top two. You know, move up at least two. There are lots of variants on this. Turns out they're all very, very highly correlated. And my sense is that it's because these things tend to be pretty continuous, right? What happens for the poorest selection of students is, is similar to what happens for the next set of students. I was just curious if there's a drastic difference between yeah. the rate. Yeah, I mean, you say conditional on going to Brown, it's, it's almost the same. And so it's just about differences in their representation in the population. Please. Um, I just have a question since you're back there. The map showing uh, mobility rates um, nationally, um, there seemed to be a, a real barrier at 15% that I see no community here yeah. that seems to have this level. And I wonder whether your approach, looking at the data in this micro way, um, takes attention away from some very major barriers to numbers ever going up very significantly. Um, th this seems striking to me, but certainly at the higher education level, I think that you know some people point to the late 80s when the cost of a full year at the Ivies went over the median national income, and need-blind financial aid became the norm, which is a double-edged sword, of course, because it need-blind, whether they're grants or loans, simply rules out a certain group that the standard package is insufficient. So I just wonder how you, how you think about, it's nice to make small incremental changes in mobility mm -hmm. rates, but if there are systemic uh, problems that are really overwhelming barriers to improvement, how do you see them? Sure. So I mean, I think the, just the first thing to say is that um, you know, 15% is actually really impressive, right? Because the, the measure that we're using is the fraction of kids from poor families that get into the top 20%. So by definition, you can never have more than 20% of students in the top 20%. And so if 15% are getting into the top 20%, that means that the difference between the very poorest children and, and the very richest children, if it's got to average to 20, is going to be like 15 to 25 or something like that, which would be uh, so that, that difference is, is 10%. The current difference in society is 30%. Um, if it were 15%, that would also be better than any uh, developed country that we have data on. So I think the highest is in Canada, where it's about 12 and a half or something like that. So um, you know, I would not, I think 15% is, is would, that would be, um, I mean, we're not going to get there. So <laughs> that's, uh, but, but that would, I think, really be quite a step forward. Um, now, maybe you ask, why isn't that 20%? Why is not completely equal uh, access or to the, to the economic success something that's feasible? And um, you know, I, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, there's just going to be a limit on, on what policy can do in a way that um, people with more money can buy more things. That's what more money gives them. And um, it's going to be very difficult to have some policy that literally equalizes everything. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, looking at some of these areas in the country where, where upward mobility, you know, in Providence, upward mobility is very similar to what it is in, in Denmark and Sweden. So, right, that's great. We don't have to go to Denmark and Sweden and all eat herring in order to have upward mobility. We can, we can do it right here. And I think at a national level, you know, some of these comparisons, I mean, I think they're less helpful from a policy perspective, but I think it's instructive that even within our country, we have this type of variation. Please. Um, so your research considers a really quantitative measure of income as the definition of success, but I was wondering how more qualitative measures such as health outcomes or satisfaction or overall yeah. improvement in quality of life can be considered through this framework. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, 
I think you can break down the answer into two parts, right? So the first is that I'm using one very particular quantitative measure, just kind of for simplicity. There are many other quantitative measures that you could still use, right? So you can use um, uh, measures of, uh, you can look at the neighborhoods people are living in for quality of life. You can understand what fraction of uh, students grow up to live in certain types of families or have certain types of jobs. You can look at who uh, has success by other measures. You can look at who gets a patent, who starts a business. You can use, uh, we don't have health measures in these data, but you can also look at, uh, you look at mortality rates. Uh, you can look at uh, who comes down with certain um, uh, chronic diseases. So, so I think there's, you can, there's a broad way that you can measure lots of different things uh, using quantitative measures. Now, I think the second part is to be completely upfront that, you know, right, there's inevitably going to be something that's going to be very difficult to measure quantitatively, something about just like deep satisfaction, you know, are, are, are you achieving success, you know, are we going to really say that someone's not successful because they're a community leader and they're doing very important things, but they're only earning $30,000 a year. And I think that, um, you know, that's why it's very important in a lot of what we do to pair some of this more quantitative analysis with much more qualitative analysis to understand, you know, in some of these places, like is Sacramento just a higher, does it just seem like a higher opportunity place because everyone's going to get jobs in the tech industry and they just have terrible jobs but they pay a lot more? Or is there something fundamentally different about how children that grew up in this neighborhood um, experience both their childhood and adulthood? So I think that, right, the, value of the quantitative stuff is I can actually put it on a map in a way that putting on the qualitative stuff on the map is a little bit harder. But I think you can use the qualitative stuff, especially at the local level, to not just understand what's going on, but really inform your solutions. You can get really, really a fine-grained sense of what works and what doesn't work, even if you can't quite put a number on it. I think that's a great question. Thank you. Please. Uh, so there is a graph and like you show the performance of like people among different ages, right? And so like do you chase chase the same group of people or like in the college status maybe they are people grow up in some other places and just come to this neighborhood for the college? Yeah. So we're tracing the same people all the way through. Okay, and that's so, very, very important, right? Because you yeah, want to make. Yeah, but like, does the percentage of like, um, like the percentage of people who go to other neighborhood for a college like matters? Well, I think it, it it may well matter as an outcome, right? Certainly, we think that going to college is a good thing, and depending on where you live, maybe going somewhere else for college is a good thing. Um, but again, again, to be clear, what we're measuring is the fraction of children from each neighborhood that go to some college. It's, it's not like you have to go to college in the district in order to count for this measure. It's like kind of like a, we're following them wherever they go. Also, like for those like people you chased, they yeah. like for the numbers So here, I'll show from, you. Yeah. Where, where are we here? Yeah, so this is like what fraction of children who grow up in Virginia Highland go to college somewhere? Doesn't have to, I mean, they're not going to college in that literal census tract, but maybe they're going to college in Georgia, in Atlanta, maybe not. We can track them wherever they go. That's right. Please go ahead. Um, actually, I was going to ask about this particular graph, too. So um, I'm thinking about actual policy solutions, and it seems like, particularly in the English AV um, neighborhood and also the other low income neighborhood that you showed, there's a particular dip um, between birth and third grade mm -hmm. and I'm wondering sort of what um, like what fraction of that dip has to do with sort of the zero to four mm. age range because there have been a lot of studies on war deficits and how children from yeah. low income families hear 30 million fewer words by the age of four than families um, or then children from high income families and I'm wondering what a policy intervention or a policy solution would look like for that because it seems a lot more challenging given that there's not sort of the institution within which that policy could sort of be localized like a school yeah. or a university. Yeah, no, you're completely right and in fact the reason why I have not broken this out into kind of zero to four and four to eight is that another downside of not having an institution, it's actually harder to get data on what's going on in this range. Um, but it is possible to get data, and especially when you kind of zoom in at a local level, maybe we won't get 
preschool access for everyone in the country, but lots of cities keep track of this. And so I think that um, there are a number of different types of interventions that you might think about exactly targeting that early age range. And so, for instance, um, there are medical treatments which help make sure that even after babies leave the hospital, they're, they're healthy and they are um, kind of have an environment which is conducive to their growth. Uh, there are policies that try to improve uh, preschool access, and th th those have been shown to be quite effective for some subpopulations, things like Head Start. Um, and then there are other uh, you know, policies to think about very early uh, grades, so the quality of kindergarten, uh, I've actually written a paper about how that can have a, have a quite large impact on, on long-term outcomes. What I think we don't find in the data, though, is there's some research that suggests that these very, very early years are particularly important in uh, child development, which I think would be especially challenging, exactly because of the lack of kind of structured spaces for children at that age. Uh, we actually don't find that. What we find is it varies a little bit from place to place, but it seems like uh, each year up to about age 23 or so um, is equally important in determining long-term outcomes. And so you know, that makes the ch ch problem maybe more challenging because you can't just fix things, you know, get kids to age three and then say that you know, their brain has um, formed and now we're done. But I think it also uh, opens up the box for a lot more interventions that thinking about what we can do in college, thinking about what high schools can do, it's not kind of all over by, uh, by that time. No question for you. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Um, I'm part of Housing Opportunities for People Everywhere on Campus, which is a, um, a group involved in homeless advocacy and outreach. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our activities right now is we're lobbying at the State House uh, for anti-discrimination measures with regards to housing vouchers for homeless people. And just um, based on your conclusions, about how a neighborhood can affect the outcomes for these low-income children. I was wondering if you thought there might be a similar effect um, with regards to homeless people going to better neighborhoods on their um, chances of not returning to the streets, for example. Yeah. So it's a great question. I mean, it's not something that I have, uh, I've looked at data on, and so it's hard to give a kind of a direct answer. But um, I think what, um, you know, one thing that has emerged from the research as a, a general pattern about what seems to correlate with kids' outcomes is it's not just something about a kid's narrow family circumstances. It's something more broadly about communities that seems to matter. So let me give you an example of that. Um, we've known for a long time that children in two-parent households kind of holding all else fixed seem to have a better chance of success. What we found is that children, even in two-parent households, have an even larger boost to their success if they are in a neighborhood with lots of other two-parent households than in a neighborhood where they're one of the only two-parent households. And it turns out that this is especially important, just in a correlational sense, for minority children. And so that's a sense in which I think the community, uh, not just what's narrowly going on in a person's exact circumstance, I think is very important. And I think you, know, you could imagine a very similar thing uh, going on for uh, trying to put uh, homeless not just kind of in a building, but embraced in a community which uh, is going to be supportive of their success. Please, in the back. Uh, hi. Um, um, so personally, I want to be an educator, and also I'm interested in education policies. Wonderful. So yeah, this is the area I'm studying, I'm trying to work on. So you know, in schools, we have the system of tracking. So on one hand, I think tracking allows, you know, students at the top, you know, they can maybe learn faster in classrooms. But also tracking, on the other hand, prevents a lot of students, um, you know, from moving up. And because you just trap the students, you know, into different groups and tracks. So my question is while we do not lower the standard of education for the people for the students at the top how, like what can we do you know to help to identify like you say identify the students or help those students in maybe other traps not to move up and receive better education yeah i mean it, it, so you know there're tracking and there are a lot of other aspects of of education policy which are which are quite tricky and and which I think kind of to get to the core of what you're asking about, there's 
an inevitable trade-off about how you're going to allocate resources and opportunities across different students in a school. You know, it's obviously a hard thing to answer in general, but I, I think what's also important to note is that it's not necessarily the case that this is a totally zero-sum game, right? In the particular measure that I'm using, just the percent in the top 20%, right, that is all relative. There can never be more than 20% of students in the top 20%. But I think there's, there are important ways in which mobility broadly can actually be a rising tide that lifts all boats. So let me, let me give you an example of that. Some recent work that my co-authors have put out study the uh, rates at which kids from different backgrounds grow up to become inventors and have a patent. And it turns out it's really very, very important. It's not surprising that you be kind of quite mathematical, have like a good math test score in order to do this. But it also uh, turns out that even among those students who are extremely talented, being from a family that gives you exposure to other inventors matters a lot. And so that means that children from richer families are much more likely to be inventors. Children from um, uh, white families are much more likely to be inventors than children from minority families. And even it correlates with whether girls and boys grow up to be an inv inventors. If it turns out that the, the number of inventors locally who are women is quite strongly predictive of the number of local children who grow up, uh, of, of girls who grow up to become inventors. And so I think that's an example of where um, you know, we're not like taking something away by having more inventors in America. We're going to invent more. There's going to be um, higher wages and, and more opportunity for all if, if we uh, broaden opportunity and, and access in this way. So um, it, it was a tough question, but I think there are ways that you can kind of achieve both. Please go ahead. You've had your hand, hand up for a while. Hi. So if by means of policy intervention, a low-income household um, actually enters the um, high-income household or the top uh, one-fifth um, for the first time, say, in generations, do they tend to stay there? Or is there still dependence yeah. on the previous generation? There's some history dependence. Yeah, there's, that's a great question. So uh, that's another one where um, you know, the tracking families over this long a time period is, is very difficult. Um, what evidence we have seems to suggest that it's kind of um, it's not history dependent, um, but there are important differences across different groups in society that have persisted. So, for instance, um, the uh, racial income gaps are something that are quite persistent, both in the sense that just you know as a fact they have not closed over the past 50 years that much, but also if you look at kids coming from similar backgrounds. So look at you know, um, a, a, a white family, a minority family, at the same income percentile, earning the same thing in the same place, it turns out that they have very, very different outcomes on average. And so I think that in, in some ways, I don't know whether that's history mattering or just some other very persistent thing going on, but, um, you know, that's, an, that's another thing that as we kind of get more data, we can code more data going backwards and have more data going forwards. Um, we're trying to code up a bunch of old go back and code up like the 1960 and 70 and 80 census so we can actually answer some of these questions. That's, that's a really great question. Over here. Pardon me while I get mic'd up. No. <laughs> uh, so uh, as a state employee, data nerd, and Brown alum, there was like no way I was not coming to this talk. So, Wonderful. Um, Glad thanks. you made this it. This is really great. Um, and so coming at it kind of from a governmental perspective, um, I, I just two, hopefully, fairly quick questions. One, uh, is it within the scope of your project to um, kind of elucidate like best practices in terms of data-based, uh, iterative, you know, uh, experimental policy implementation, mm -hmm. best practices for piloting, stuff like that? If, I didn't know if that's like a, a work product that your project was going to do. Second question was just, um, you're using this data to look prescriptively, normatively looking forward. Um, and you know, when we do intervention X, this is Y, delta and outcome. I was wondering if you've used this data to look retrospectively at when certain policies were implemented yeah. to try and you know, come up with correlation or causality and using that as kind of a potential guide for crafting yeah. Your future, you know, looking yeah. policy. So I think that's a great question. And it's actually one of the things that we're really hoping to do, um, you know, after we have released these data. So um, let me just go back here. So what we're doing is, um, 
quickly here. Uh, this map, um, you're going to be able to look at this map for anywhere in the country that you want online in about two months. Um, and you can download the data and do whatever you want with it. Um, there's vastly too much in here for us to study all on our own. And so what we are very much hoping is that uh, folks like you can work with the data and analyze policies that are often, you know, some, some of the most impactful policies we think are ones that happen at the local level and therefore, you know, as an unfortunate consequence, we don't have big national data sets of all the kind of neighborhood level policies that, that were implemented 20 or 30 years ago. So I think there's a lot of scope for that to happen going forward. And I think part of that, we're hoping to work with policymakers as they do. But I think a lot of it's going to happen just as people download the data. Um, and our approach is in you know, all of this, in the, you know, the, all the college data that I showed you for every single college in the country is online and available. And there have uh, been a bunch of really interesting analyses that have come out where people compare it in other uh, new ways, uh, compare within the data. They import um, other policies and look at how things have changed. Um, and I think the same thing can happen in, in these data. So, um, you know, it's a, your, your intuition is exactly right that I think that's something that we can do going forward. No, sorry. Let me maybe give the final question. It looks like we're up, up against time. So, so one thing that you kind of skip by a little bit quickly in your talk that I think is fascinating is what's happened to state yeah, let me go universities back there. over time. And, you know, the really high mobility, high success right. rate universities were these kind of mid-tier states. And there is a policy move towards sort of free college in New York yeah. and Rhode Island and other states. I just thought you might want to comment on that. Yeah, sure. So first of all, let me just, um, you're right, I didn't spend as much time on this. But um, we find, so to recall, this is where we found that uh, access, the fraction of poor children, uh, poor students on campus at these uh, Ivy League schools has gone up only a little bit over our sample period. What we also find is that some of these schools that were very high mobility have seen declining access. So the fraction of uh, poor students at Cal State LA, which was the top school on that top 10 list that I showed you, has fallen from about 34% down to 22%. So right, that's still quite incredible that they have more students than proportionally are in the population nationally on campus. Um, but it's much lower than it once was. And so, um, you know, we're actually also working with Cal State to try to understand, first of all, what it is that they're doing right, but then also what are the, the challenges that they're facing over um, the, the past 15 years. Uh, in some sense, these declines are even more surprising given that the fraction of low-income children who are going to college has actually been going up over this period. So it's gone up from something like 25% to about 40%. And so if just... If, if anything, you would expect it to be going the other way. Um, and I think the answer from a, I, I don't know what is going on or what the precise uh, solution is, but what you can find in the data are certain schools that are kind of swimming against the tide. And so there's some, uh, in lots of different places, uh, UC San Diego is one that stands out as having increased access within the UC system, which might be a, a good comparison for UC Berkeley. Um, you know, maybe a good comparison for SUNY Stony Brook. There's a school called uh, Georgia State in Atlanta that's actually seen success. Uh, the, the access rate go up from about 7% to 9 or 10% over the past, um, uh, past 15 years. And I think those are the examples that we want to get into to understand uh, how can we fight against, what, what are they doing that these other schools are not doing in order to, um, to solve this problem? And, I, you know, it's, in our policy work, it didn't talk about this as much, but, you know, in the same way that we're very much hoping to think about the particular problems that uh, we face at an institution like Brown, we're also working with these other institutions to uh, solve what are a very different set of challenges, both in terms of recruiting students, in terms of supporting them on campus, uh, you know, things like, um, food insecurity and homelessness is a huge problem at Cal State LA in a way that it's much, much less of a problem here. Um, and so we, once again, I think we need kind of local tailored solutions to these problems. Great. Um, we've come to the end of our time uh, for this seminar. Please uh, join me in thanking John. Thank you, Rick, for the invitation.